record and start admitting people. Thank you for that for the reminder. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome to our Latinx professional panel. Um, we'll go ahead and just let people trickle in. Are we supposed to sign in someplace? Yes, I will put in the sign in sheet right now. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, so welcome everyone. Thank you so much for all of you being here and joining us for our Latinx professional panel. Um, please be sure to go ahead um, and sign in. I put the sign in sheet already. Um, this will be important too, in case you weren't able to sign up through the Vision Resource Center, I can go ahead and make sure we can add you so that you may receive Flex or CPGU credit for this event. Thank you all. Although all those of you that I just let in, thank you so much for being here. Welcome, welcome. Um, I'm putting the sign in sheet just again, um, just to make sure if those of you that weren't able to sign in, um, just please, please make sure you um, sign in for today. Thank you. Yes, I will sign you in, Carmen. Thank you. Yes, of course. Andy. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Ida. Hello all, welcome, welcome. We will get started soon. Um, please make sure those of you that are signing in, um, you go ahead and go to the chat box and use our sign in sheet, please. So I'll go ahead and I will get started. Thank you again um, for everyone coming to our third event for our Latinx Heritage Month for our Latinx professional panel. Um, so for those of you who do not know me, my name is Carla Ruiz. I am the cultural diversity coordinator here at GCC as well as an academic counselor. Um, so I'm very excited to bring you, you know, all these events and programming. Um, so without further ado, I also want to introduce our other moderator for this event, Fidel Gonzalez. Fidel. Hi everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Fidel Gonzalez. I am a counselor over with student equity right here at Glendale College. Thank you, Fidel. Um, so both of us will be moderating. So if you have any questions or anything, you can also um, either ask questions to me or Fidel, um, and we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, Alexandra, thank you for being here. <laughs> um, so I wanted to go ahead and get started with introductions um, and the biographies of our panelists for today. So I will start today with Luis Almonte. Uh, Luis Almonte serves as the Vice President of Operations and Community Engagement, responsible for the Discovery Cube Los Angeles Science Center. Luis has a master's in business administration from Chapman University with a minor in e-commerce. He's native to Brooklyn, New York, and is raised between was raised between New York and the Dominican Republic. Luis is a current uh, resident of the San Fernando Valley in Chatsworth. He's married to Evelyn Almonte, he has three boys, Antonio, 27, Jaden, 12, and Julian, 11. 
please um, welcome me, uh, help me welcome uh, Luis Almonte today. <laughs> In addition today, we also have Miriam Joya. Miriam Joya is a crisis counselor and support psychiatrist, a social worker for the Los Angeles Unified School District. She has a bachelor's of arts in sociology and Central American studies from CSUN and a master's of social work from USC. She is a licensed clinical social worker and holds a pupil personal service, services credential. Please help me welcome Miriam. <laughs> Next, we have Asilenia. Asilena Santos is a brand manager for Just My Talent and executive assistant. Asilenia also has an associate's in applied arts, fashion design, and merchandising from Katherine Gibbs New York College, and a bachelor's degree in business administration and design and marketing from Parsons, the new school of design. Please welcome Asilenia Santos. <laughs> Last but not least, we also have Estevi Ruiz. Estevi is a lawyer with his own law firm in North Hollywood, California. He has a bachelor's in art with a minor in art history from UC Santa Barbara. He holds a Juris Doctorate from Western State College of Law and has worked pro bono with Harriet Buai Center for Family Law and for the California Innocence Project. Um, in addition, we will be having Eileen Urgarte, who will be showing up a little late. We all know things happen in our, in our work life, um, but she will show up later. She is all school psychologist working in an urban neighborhood. She grew up in the diverse and resilient city of East Los Angeles and possesses a bachelor's of arts in psychology, a bachelor's of art in Chicana Chicano studies, and a master's of, uh, of arts in educational psychology with an educational specialist degree and a pupil personal services credential. She is first generation Generation, Latinx bilingual woman, educator, sister, and amiga. So hopefully we'll be able to welcome her very soon. Thank you all for being here today. I really appreciate you showing up um, for our GCC community. Um, and so we wanted to go ahead and get started um, with the very first question that we have for you all. Um, and so our first question today would be, how did you enter the field you are currently in? And what has your academic path and career path been like? And Sorry, you doing it in a certain order or whichever, <laughs> whichever you'd like, whoever would like to go first. <laughs> so um, hi everyone again. I'm Luis Almonte. So I uh, you know, I grew up between New York and the Dominican Republic. So when I came back to New York when I was 17, um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I graduated high school, I did my last year in, in New York, and then I joined the army. And I served the army for 10 years. And then I decided that I want to go to school. So I got out, went to school, earned my associates and my bachelor's. And I worked the first 15 years at Discovery Cube as um, the director of IT. So I was responsible for the IT for, um, we had three locations at the time. Now we have two in Orange County in Los Angeles. Um, and uh, when the pandemic happened, uh, you know, a lot of staff was let go and a lot, the organization really changed because, you know, we couldn't serve the public anymore. And during that restructure, um, I ended up being promoted and I took over the Discovery Cube Los Angeles Museum. So basically, you know, over the course of the last, you know, 30 years, I was, you know, in the army, I was a nuclear and biological chemical operations specialist. I used to plot nuclear bombs. Then I went to IT because I didn't really find an equivalent of my army job in, in the civilian world. And then because of the pandemic, I ended up changing um, to my current job now where I run the museum. So I, I think that, you know, I, I've definitely taken a weird track to get to where I've been, but uh, um, education is, has been key for me. Uh, like I said, when I joined the military, I didn't, I, I barely even spoke English at the time. So I didn't know what to do. Um, and education just really helped me along the way. And I'm a true believer in it. And I'm glad that now at Discovery Cube, we get to do educational programs, um, you know, to keep uh, our, our kids learning. So that's my. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I can go next. So good afternoon, everyone, or good evening. I'm super excited and honored um, to be here. So um, my name is Miriam Joya. Uh, my parents are from El Salvador. I grew up just wanting to give back to my community, wanting to give back to a lot of um, of our undocumented family. So that really led me. I remember when I was in high school and I was asked, what do you want to be when you grow up, right? Or what do you want to study? And I remember just, it was art class, I think, <laughs> from what I remember. So I just remember doing this drawing and saying activist. So for me, um, I always kind of knew. Um, I was admitted at CSUN. Um, I was the first one to graduate high school and then the first one to attend college. Um, 
in my family. So it was a huge deal that I was at CISA, not really knowing what I was doing, to be completely honest. Um, I did major initially in business and marketing. Um, and then I remember taking a sociology class and saying, wow, this, this is like something I'm like really intrigued you. Like I really want to learn more. So I took more sociology classes. I changed my major to sociology and then added Central American studies as a double major. So um, I remember that I asked myself, wow, this means I still have to stay at CISA in like a fifth year. <laughs> is it worth it? And, and yes, of course it was worth it. Um, I, I am truly, I, I feel that I'm, I'm, I don't know, maybe it was like a message or calling for me to say, hey, continue, like keep, keep going. So um, I remember that I applied for uh, my MSW at USC straight from, straight from um, undergrad. I wish I would have taken a break to be completely honest. I just, <laughs> went straight through, but um, I was um, a first generation um, Salvadorian American at CSUN and then at USC and just finding, trying to figure out how do I belong here. Um, I joined the Latinx Social Work Caucus at, at, at USC and I joined um, a multicultural sorority in undergrad, so I felt that um, a huge part of my academic success and, and my journey has been through networking and building community with a lot of folks that are either going through similar experiences as me or mentors, for example, ensuring that I had people that that um, that kind of provided that advice for me. So yeah, that was my career path. Um, I was a mental health provider at Amanecer Community Counseling Services, providing mental health support through for students in K through 12, addressing trauma, grief and loss, everything. Um, then I started my journey at LAUSD in 2015. So um, I provided support to middle school and high school students, addressed suicide ideation, risk, tons of risk assessments. The pandemic was really, really tough, to be completely honest. Um, and now I'm in a, in a role as a crisis counseling and support um, psychiatric social worker, where I'm providing um, clinical supervision for um, PSW, psychiatric social workers that are trying to change their clinical license. So it's been a huge journey for me. I don't know what the next steps are, but um, definitely super grateful for where I am. Thank you, Miriam. Hi, so I'm Asi Legna Santos. I'm also Dominican from New York. So it's a breath of fresh air to see Dominicans in LA, right? Um, so my journey is also very interesting. I started, well, my growing up in New York, my parents, my last two years of high school, they moved to Florida. So it was a hot mess. So then after I graduated, I decided to um, leave Florida because I hated it. <laughs> And I went back home um, and I was able, I wasn't able to get into my school, the school of my dreams right away. So I applied to Catherine Gibbs. Um, in the process, I was able to get an internship at Sean John Enterprises, which for me was an honor because I always used to tell my mom that someday I'll work for Puffy. But, um, and even though it wasn't a job, it was a great accomplishment for me. Um, then there I was able to meet his stylist. So I was able to intern in the music side of things. Um, and then after that, um, I actually freelance as a technical designer for a few private labels in New York, like Jones, New York. Um, and then I also worked for Baby Fat for a little while and for some fashion companies within the um, fashion week and television production. Um, and then in between that, I was able to get into the school of my, of my dreams, which was Parsons. Um, and there things changed a little bit. I actually, because I enjoyed the music side of things, I wanted to see how to combine music and fashion. So I took an internship in a label and, uh, which is where I met the person who I, my client now, um, and I was there for about two years. And then I, before I graduated, I took another internship at another label. And then after that, I worked for Christie's. Um, and that was extremely not happy there. <laughs> so uh, the person who I work with now, which is a nationally syndicated radio personality, 
Um, she told me, well, come work with me because she really liked the way I worked at the label. Um, and here I am. I started as her executive assistant. Um, now I'm her brand manager and, um, and sky's the limit for me. I have a few businesses that are in the works with her and by myself. Um, and I also plan to do and establish myself here in LA within the community, so. I'm guessing it's my turn. <clears throat> uh, so I'm at Stevie Ruiz um, and I uh, am currently a practicing lawyer and I have my own law firm. Um, I started to, to toy with the idea of becoming a lawyer when I was about 12 years old and I had a little competition at my middle school um, where they, the teacher gave us a fact pattern about a pizza that had some plastic on it. And I had to give the closing argument in the, to my middle school class. <clears throat> uh, when I gave my closing argument to the middle, middle school class, I had a unanimous jury verdict. So everybody in uh, the classroom raised their hand and they voted with my side. And it sort of inspired in me this idea that I could become a lawyer because maybe I had you know, the right personality, the right look, or I could just make good arguments and move forward with that. And the idea of becoming a lawyer uh, stuck in my mind throughout most of my uh, you know, teenage years and all the way up until um, I started LA Valley College, which is a community college in the San Fernando Valley. <clears throat> uh, at Valley College, I did you know, what I thought would be the most natural route to becoming a lawyer. I studied philosophy, I studied political science, and I said to myself, okay, this is the route that I'm going to take uh, to become a lawyer. But then I, I had a, a change in direction. I decided to go into the arts, uh, went to UC Santa Barbara. I studied art history as a minor. Uh, I majored in studio art where I did painting, sculpture, uh, electronic art, anything and everything that you could possibly think of in, in terms of art. Uh, there's a mural in Santa Barbara that stretches 57 feet and is about 15 feet high, which I painted and it still exists today that I, as, I, as far as I know. Um, after Santa Barbara, I came back home to the San Fernando Valley. Um, and one of my buddies who I'd met in Santa Barbara, he indicated that his dad was, was a lawyer, uh, needed some help at his practice. <clears throat> uh, so from about 2013 uh, till 2020, I worked with that law firm. I worked with the firm throughout all of law school. Um, <clears throat> and I worked through, throughout all of law school with that firm. Um, I took the bar exam, passed the bar exam, and then in the middle of the pandemic, I decided to branch out and go on my own uh, to open up my own law firm. Uh, I currently practice uh, civil litigation. I've had three trials in the last two and a half years that I've been practicing. I should also note that I've only been practicing for two and a half years, which is very early on for any lawyer in any career. But in that time, I've had uh, two jury trials and one court trial. And I anticipate at least another couple of trials in the next six months. <clears throat> um, other than that, I mean, yeah, that, that's who I am. Thank you. Um, Eileen was a, has been able to join us. Um, so Eileen, uh, our question was, how did you enter the field you're currently in? And what has been your academic career path? Hello, everyone. Happy Wednesday. My name's Eileen Uriarte. Um, I sound a little iffy battling a flu. I promise it's not COVID. I got tested like three times. Um, I'm a school psychologist. Um, I am a daughter. I am bilingual, Spanish and English. I am also a friend um, and a researcher. So I grew up in East Africa. I think we did. Oh, uh, I think we lost her, yeah. Yeah, I think we lost her. Yeah. Okay. Let's just give her a second. Yeah, she might be rejoining. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. 
Well, we'll go ahead and um, hopefully let her answer uh, the question after she comes back, but um, we can go ahead and move on to the second question. All right, we'll transition to the next one. Um, I love hearing everyone's stories. So I'm, I'm so grateful to be able to uh, be in uh, this room together. Now, we all know that identity is important to each one of us. So which identities are important for you? And how do you think that has affected your academic and career journey? Do I start again? Uh, <laughs> um, okay. Um, you know, I, I consider myself an American first. You know, I, I, I was born in this country and I served this country. Um, and and uh, I would say that I, I try not to get caught up in labels. I really um, look at everyone the same way. You know, my oldest son is half white. And, you know, he grew up with the same customs and courtesies that I grew up with, with, you know, with being Dominican, with being American. So I, I would say that that's what I consider myself first. Um, also, I believe in um, investing in, the, in my community and I believe in taking my parents' heritage and continuing on. So, for example, me and my kids go to Dominican Republic every February and we're part of the carnival in the part of the uh, where I'm from, where a place called La Vega. Um, and, uh, you know, it's something that my kids, even though they've grown up here, in the United States, they know exactly how the carnival works, you know, how many people join a group, they, they just know a lot about that. Um, and it's also helped me along the way, uh, you know, with my career choices and even school, because I've been able to bring um, stories about, you know, where I grew up and where my people grew up. And then now, like, I'm in a small community here in like San Fernando Valley, for example, I, I, you know, I work by Pacoima, um, you know, uh, there's a couple of cities around here. But anyway, my point is that I get to work with a lot of kids that are in the same situation that I grew up in. You know, inner city, even though, you know, it's a suburb here, it feels like inner city in the sense that, you know, you're either part of a gang or you're running from a gang. You know, you, you have to make a lot of decisions. You're getting all these labels. Are you Latinx? Are you Hispanic? Are you South American? Um, and you're trying to deal with all of that. And I think that, um, I, I had some important people in my family that kind of put me on the straight and narrow. And, and I feel like if I take all of that and I put it together, now I'm able to turn around and give that back to my community and give that back to my kids and be able to have conversations with a group of other professionals that have similar stories. Thank you, Luis. Wait. Am I next? Okay. So, <laughs> so I, I was actually born in Dominican Republic, but I came here when I was two months um, for a long time. Um, well, I actually didn't know that for a while um, until it was time to, I got older and I understood the process of traveling. Um, but one thing that my family is, is very uh, close to, they, they study Africanism. So um, I do consider myself an Afro-Latino, um, and that ha has helped me a lot in teaching others about just history and identity within our community and, us, and also colorism. Um, and also it has helped, uh, especially my family who has a, a festival in New York, well, they used to have a festival in New York um, every year to kind of bring the Dominican and Haitian community together um, and have fun and kind of enjoy the similarities of our culture. Um, so it just has helped me to educate others and to help people also understand themselves. Um, and I think, you know, because here in America, sometimes it's a little hard. You either you're black enough or you're not, or you're Latin enough or you're not, or, you know, so it's very hard to understand sometimes, but I feel like me educating others and coming to terms with what I am has helped me help others understand their culture and their background. Thank you, Asilenia. Uh, so for myself, um, a huge part of my identity is identifying as Salvadorian American, um, as a first generation Salvadorian American here in the United States. Um, it goes back to like me just really, once I was at CSUN and I started um, learning more about um, the Central American diaspora, learning about um, why Salvadorians fled a civil war, I realized, wow, there's this thing called intergenerational trauma. And I just want to challenge that. It's not just trauma, it's intergenerational resilience, right? And for me, it's just, I take huge pride in saying, you know, 
my ancestors, my family have been through a lot and I'm in a position to, to make change, to bring in um, uncomfortable conversations, to help, to help um, in hopes of creating interventions for, for our students. Um, so working in LAUSD, we have a huge population of um, people of color, of families of color, right? Of undocumented families, for example. So um, I'm super excited because we're working on a presentation, on a training for um, supporting our newcomers. So a lot of them from around the world, actually. So I'm learning, I'm growing each day and uh, really using my voice to, to, uh, to, you know, to create advocacy for, for our communities. Thank you. <clears throat> this was a uh, Stevie Ruiz. Um, this was a difficult question for me to answer just because when I think about identity, I can't help but think about, you know, the entire history of my lineage and whatever that might be, um, you know, including, you know, doing a sample of 23 and me just to figure out really how far back does my history go and whether I would identify with something far, far in the past. Uh, I remember the first time that I went to Mexico uh, in Jalisco in like the Northern part of Jalisco. And I first saw the land and the beauty of, of Mexico. I mean, it, it's like nothing else. And I felt that that was completely embedded in me even though I'd never seen it before, right? But the first time that I laid eyes on it I immediately felt connected to the land and the people and everything about the ranch lifestyle and the, the humble lifestyle that exists in that area. Um, and then also at the same time with like carving out a path for yourself, which is something that uh, comes from, you know, so many other aspects of my history and just the person that I am. You know, I, I can't deny the fact that I'm a Spanish speaking individual, that I have some kind of history to Spain, that I have this language that I can speak and uh, that it's had a major effect um, not only on this part of the world, but on me also and the way that I communicate. Sometimes even I find myself more comfortable speaking in Spanish than I do speaking in English. For some reason, it's like I can get my feelings out a little bit better in Spanish than I can when I'm speaking uh, English. <laughs> Which is very awkward because all my life I've been an English speaker and I've been taught to communicate with the world around me in English. But you know, there are just some things that are embedded in me that I, I, I can't ignore, and that's my, my Spanish speaking ability, which is something that has really um, been beneficial here in Los Angeles and in the community where we have a lot of uh, Spanish speaking only individuals who sometimes they don't have the resources and other times they've been entrepreneurial and they've succeeded and they have you know resources at their disposal, but there's no, um, you know, person in their network or oftentimes there's not a person in their network that they can reach out for like a legal problem in my situation um but yeah hopefully that answers the question thank you um so i want to invite eileen back <laughs> sorry everyone technical difficulties um but i'll just give a, a brief summary of what i do and then I'll, I'll go ahead and address the question but i am a school psychologist working for ala usd i attended uh, Cal State Northridge, where I got my BA in psychology and BA in Chicano Chicana studies. Then I went ahead and pursued my master's at LMU, where I got a master's in educational psychology, uh, educational specialist degree, and then my PPS credentials. So um, I love working with the youth, K through 12th grade um, of all ages, predominantly my experiences in urban inner city schools. Um, it is a passion of mine also working with um, adolescents in the juvenile justice system uh, because there is an, you know, adding on to my identity is the resiliency of being a Latina first gen low income. Um, one of the things for, you know, all those three in my identity, I'm going to root it back to they all have developed some sort of resiliency that has helped me throughout um, and that resiliency. I you know, cannot speak for the story of the kiddos I work with or their families, um, but I can say that it has been um, a great experience to be able to embed that trust and to know, you know, the bad student with the bad behavior, there's more to that and they might not have the most passing grades, but whether they have a disability in learning or whatever it might be to be able to advocate for their resiliency because 
my mom is still that in me as a, a first gen low income is I think the biggest part of my identity that no nos rajamos, right? So we don't we don't give up. <laughs> Thank you, Eileen. Um, all right, so for um, our next question, we have, what are some personal struggles or challenges that you have faced in the pursuit of your success? How did you overcome them? So I'll start. Um, so one of the challenges that I face is that um, as a businesswoman in this industry or any industry, you kind of have to be and portray to be the strong person. And, you know, this is sense, I'm a little sensitive. So I had to really come to find a balance um, in order to be in a room and being able to um, articulate what I feel without having to get emotional. So that was, that has been, and, and I'm still dealing with it, you know, but every day is growth. Um, and I am extremely grateful for the people that I work with. Um, I, I, I work with a very strong woman and she has kind of really walked me through the process of surviving in this industry. So um, yeah, that's, 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 a, that's one of my main struggles. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'll go next. Uh, so back when I was at, Valley College, <clears throat> there was a professor of mine, my English 103 professor or something, I think it was world literature. And he, he mentioned to me that a couple of my essays, they seemed disjointed. It seemed like from one sentence to another, he couldn't keep up with my train of thought. He didn't really understand uh, the ideas that I was trying to present to him. <clears throat> and he was the first professor that had ever mentioned that to me. And it, initially I was a little bit thrown away and I said, oh my God, how could you possibly say this? You know, my ego immediately took over and I said, no, I'm a good writer. You can't possibly tell me what, <clears throat> what's what. And then he gave me a very poor grade. Uh, and yeah. after I got the very poor grade, I said, you know what, maybe I should look a little bit deeper into this and figure out what's going on. So I attended um, a couple of sessions with the school psychologist or disability counselor we ran through a bunch of testing and then I discovered that um, my spatial intelligence was like off the charts, but my verbal, no, yeah, my verbal intelligence was not really within the same range. And so my visual mind was working a lot more than my verbal mind. <clears throat> and so I was having trouble in expressing things when it came to writing, when it came to reading, I wasn't really digesting information as well as I could. <clears throat> when I discovered that, that was one of the that was one of the reasons why I shifted over to studying art. I said, "Well, I need to play to my strengths, right? I should just become an artist. I have this wonderful understanding of spatial intelligence. So let me see if I can just hone in my skills there." So I went through and I got more into art and just understanding art um, uh, within well, understanding art and using. Um, my verbal intelligence in the art world, it made it easier for me to just understand more critical thinking, more of the research skills that are required to, um, you know, help my verbal intelligence, you know, meet my spatial intelligence. Uh, and that, that was a challenge for me because, you know, I was labeled as a um, a person who had an, a, a disability basically in school. I was given additional resources and it was kind of embarrassing for me, but at the same time, I said to myself, no, I got to play to my strengths and figure out how to do these things. Um, every now and then, you know, I still have some trouble in getting through reading or writing something, but uh, it's not something that has inhibited me so significantly. You know, I'm a lawyer today. Thank you for sharing that. I can go next. Um, for me, the biggest struggle so far has been being able to take time off without feeling guilty. Um, so although I can be a, a big advocate for, you know, the families that I assist in, in you know, when there is a diagnosis of a disability, um, just like Stevie mentioned, um, you know, it, it takes a lot of explaining to students what that means and for them to advocate. I had to dig deeper and say, okay, well, why is it so hard for me to take time off without feeling guilty about it or feeling like my work ethic is being questioned, right? And I pinpointed it to growing up, it's like this scarcity mindset, not for all Latinx communities, but you know, for some it, it's the, you have to work hard, you can miss work, you know, it, you have to be trabajadora all the time. And, you know, I realized through therapy as well, 
taking time off is needed for me to continue to pour in other people's cups. So it doesn't speak less of the passion I have for my kiddos. And it speaks more to really taking care of yourself, right? And if you work so hard to have a job that has benefits and that um, is being paid for, then, you know, take the time off. And, and, you know, when you're needed, you know, 24 hours later or whenever you come back, work will be there. Work doesn't go anywhere, right? So definitely I had a struggle, um, you know, not feeling guilty about the self-care component. Thank you. That's huge. I can relate. <laughs> um, for me, as, as I like really reflect a lot on like my college experience and even to this point, I am, it's imposter syndrome. I'll label it. Um, part of it in undergrad is saying, wow, I'm here. Like, what am I doing here? Then I get to USC and I'm like, I don't think I belong here. Like all these like thoughts in the back of my mind. Um, and I, I can really validate and say that a lot of it is because it's so much newness happening and you're learning to maneuver through all these systems um, and it's hard, right? So even now as a supervisor, I, you know, I'm transitioning to this role. I still have that in the back of my mind. I'm like, wow, I do know what I'm saying. Like, I do know what I'm doing. And like a lot of like reaffirmation, um, you know, self-talk, like letting myself know, like, I, I do belong here. I got this position for a reason. And now I'm helping guide uh, social workers and addressing a lot of mental health concerns school-wide. So I'm still, it's still sinking in. I, I can't tell you it's it's there yet, <laughs> but um, yeah, that's something that I actively, I'm, I'm struggling with, but um, yeah, I, my current boss said, hey, you need to shut that up, that little voice in the back of your mind, you do belong. So that was actually gonna be my advice to everyone. <laughs> Thank you for that, Miriam. Yeah, imposter syndrome, it'll, it'll invade us in different ways that we don't even know. <laughs> yeah. So I'm guessing I'm it now. <laughs> Um, you know, for me, the, one of the bi biggest struggles that I ever dealt with was that, you know, getting out of the military at 28, when I had joined, you know, when I was like 17, it was hard to adapt back to the civilian world. And then also, it was kind of weird going to college with a bunch of 18 year olds, right? Because I'm, I'm already yeah. almost 30. By that time, I only had my oldest son at that time. But still, it was, it was uncomfortable. But one of the things that I will say is that it's helped me a lot now because in the past you know in the past four years i mean I, I have about 400 employees total and you know they're all ages all nationalities and i feel like the the younger they are the harder it is sometimes to deal with them because you know a lot of times they they don't get interested in something or they'll quit you know like two months we invest into an employee and then they'll quit because they found another job that that pays them attention but I feel like I can relate more with them because when I did my especially my associate's degree and some of my bachelor's I was literally 10 14 years older than the kids that were in the classroom so I think that that was my biggest struggle but it also helps me today nice thank you <laughs> I can definitely relate to a lot of what was said um, so the next question for all of you is, how did your Latinx identity factor into you navigating professional spaces or maybe in your current professional spaces? I, I'll start off. I have a small anecdote. <clears throat> um, when I was working at the law firm uh, immediately after UC Santa Barbara, I think it was within the first uh, six months or so. Um, I was getting, you know, comfortable with this new space. I'd never worked in the legal field. I knew maybe one lawyer in my entire life. And now I was working in the, in the law office in Calabasas, right? And so Calabasas is a nice area of Los Angeles. <clears throat> and I sat down to lunch with uh, the lead attorney and um, a guy who had just taken the bar exam, but he wasn't a lawyer yet. And we were sitting down to lunch. And I said to them, oh, you know, I just read an article about how uh, people who are millionaires and billionaires, uh, they have a very closed network of, um, of friends and associates with whom they confide in. Um, and it's very difficult to actually get into that group. And, you know, mind you, I am a first generation Mexican American born in North Hollywood. I didn't know any billionaires or millionaires. Now, the two people that I was sitting across in that table they knew billionaires and they knew millionaires. And so it was very unusual for me to like realize in that moment that, hey, 
I was the guy out of the loop in this situation. And so that was one of those things where I really needed to learn to know my audience in that situation. Um, and I, I came to learn that more and more as the years went on and I got more comfortable with the, the, the space that I was in. <clears throat> um, you know, one of those things, especially when you're looking forward to your career and your professional life, it's know, know who your audience is, right? Thank you. So I think it's, it has helped me in being able to educate a lot of the people around me about my culture. Um, I work mostly in hip hop, so uh, or people who were or who are from the hip hop and R and B genre when it comes to music, and I just feel like um, it just has helped me educate to educate them more about the Latin culture and the differences. Um, even though we speak one language, a lot of us have different customs and eat different foods and um, have different ethnicities and um, and even even the Spanish that we speak is different. So it just has been able to um, bring that knowledge to a community that may not necessarily know the differences within our community. Yes, thank you so much for sharing that. It's um, it's something I think that people lack in understanding, like the Latinx community, you know, due to colonialism, so many so many different identities come from this background. Right. So highlighting those, yeah, for sure, important. Thank you so much. No problem. I can go next. I saw Miriam looking at me like I see you, Eileen. <laughs> <laughs> um, for myself, I think uh, representation. Right. So in, in the field that I work in, it's not only um, for mental health, but um, really helping children with you know, not only disabilities, but advocating for the parents, like I mentioned. But when they there's something about not just physical representation, because I really do believe you may look like somebody, but that doesn't mean they're going to trust you. Right. It doesn't mean that just because you speak Spanish that they are going to feel comfort or open those doors of being vulnerable or sharing. So. Um, when I am in, in these contiguous meetings, sometimes with, with um, attorneys of educational law or things of that sort, when parents come in and they see you, but then they, they hear you speak Spanish and they hear you bring over, you know, anecdotal experience about, hey, yeah, I know what it's like when, um, you know, no hay dinero para los viles. Either you, you're going to get like um, a toy or you have to buy groceries, right? And, and when they hear just similarities in, in that way, it just opens the flood to them allowing you the space to come into their life, right? So I think representation in, in that sense has really helped me build trust um, in a community that has a lot of distrust to school systems for many, many reasons. And I acknowledge it's not my role to amend all the pieces, but I can you know, it's a, it's a shark tank of a system, the educational system. So I don't have control over everything, but I do have control, you know, one family at a time knowing, you know, the degrees don't make me more than you or they don't make me, you know, I, I'm human. I'm, I'm human and um, I'm just appear to be a human that in this case can can help, you know. So that's, that's my take on that. Thank you, Eileen. Yeah, it's a piggy off, piggy off of what Eileen just mentioned. Um, for me, it was like engaging, building rapport with a lot of um, families. Uh, one of the biggest um, interventions that I've been able to facilitate um, is this group called Resilient Families. It's a parent um, group. There's two versions, either a four week or a 10 week um, version of our group. And basically it really teaches a lot about what trauma is, what ACEs are, uh, destigmatizing mental health, providing coping skills, um, and then really like helping um, parents be able to uh, support their children if they're experiencing any mental health concerns. So for me, it was just like a very humbling and um, I would really want to say a healing experience to be able to be in that space with a lot of uh, mothers and fathers that have never been able to identify all these emotions they, they've had. And even ha bringing in that cultural um, awareness, right? And responses, um, the case del estrés, it's not, it's, not, it's not just your back hurting, it's your stress, your anxious, it's because of everything that you're facing, lack of work, the pandemic, right? So 
um, yeah, for me, it was one of the biggest um, interventions that I was able to facilitate. And um, I felt that I really was able to, you know, heal my little inner child that wanted to help my parents, but I was able to like help other other parents. And I know that trickles down to the kids. So it was really nice. Thank you, Miriam. Oh, I guess uh, what I could say is that, uh, you know, being in the military, I traveled through a lot of places and the majority of the places that I went or got stationed to were English speaking places. So I never really had a chance to talk a lot of Spanish unless I was around Dominicans or Puerto Ricans. But um, when I started working at the museum, that was my first opportunity because I moved to California and all of a sudden everybody speaks Spanish no matter where I go. And then once I moved to San Fernando Valley, it's even more. So I would say that, you know, uh, being able to speak Spanish and and uh, uh, has allowed me to, to communicate to our guests, to relate to a lot of the things that they're saying. And, you know, to this day, we still get a lot of parents and families that come in that don't speak English at all. Um, and luckily for me, I have a huge staff of Spanish speaking people, but I've got I've had to get involved in, you know, complaints or whatever. And just being able to communicate in Spanish has uh, been able to allow me to diffuse a situation where I wouldn't be able to if I did not So I'm, I'm really happy about that. And I'm happy that we continue to do a lot of programs that are bilingual. Um, and, you know, hopefully we can get into eventually into other languages. But just having a second language and it being Spanish is definitely helping me a lot. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much, Luis. Um, it's major, right? That the language can be such a difference sometimes. Um, and it's so cold, like the cultural impact of it too, is, is just um, great to see. Um, all right, so our next question is, um, is there anyone in Latinx history or your own personal life who has particularly inspired you and the work that you do? Um, for me, there's not really, um... There's not really a person, I will say just my culture. Um, I am so happy to be from such a rich uh, island um, with so many cultures within itself. Um, amazing food, um, amazing music. Um, so I don't necessarily, it was a very hard question for me because I'm like, who could I say? But I just, I came to the conclusion that it's just my my culture and my country and um, even though I never really lived there, um, living in New York and Harlem and Washington Heights, I never escaped it. Um, and my family made sure that they ingrained with me the history and the language and everything else that comes with it. Um, and that has helped me tremendously in my identity and also in being able to share so much of it with uh, everybody else. Um, and how important the island was just throughout history um, in general. So I will say, I'll just give it to the, I'll make the island the person. Awesome. Thank you, Asilenia. <laughs> For me, it's my mom and my dad. Um, if I can say my mom, especially, Ponte Las Filas, you need to keep going no matter what. You might cry it out, but it doesn't matter. Get back up. Um, and a lot of it is they live it through. They don't just talk about it. They, they do it, right? Um, and um, they really exemplify the importance of being humble and being grateful. And no matter what, you keep pushing, you keep going. Yeah. Thank you. For myself, I, I share the same sentiment like Miriam, it's my mother. Um, she was a single mother for a long time. So just the, once again, the strength and the resiliency that she always portrayed. And, and for her, she would always say, I remember growing up, your only job is to do good in school. And your only job is, you know, and, and my mom wasn't, um, she isn't, you know, thankfully I'm blessed to still have her. She's standing at 5'2", but man, her character, she's the most kind-hearted, but yet so fierce in every way. Um, and she wasn't really into, um, you know, we, we hear a lot of the stereotypical kind of um, roles that sometimes, you know, in this case, Mexican mothers can play like being submissive or things of that sort. And I remember Chicano Chicana study classes 
when a professor would ask questions like, how many of you does your mom wake up early to make your dad lunch, right? And I would see everyone raising their hand. And, and I, I remember questioning like, whoa, did my mom not do something right? Like, wh why do I feel like the odd one out, right? Not that there's anything wrong in that, but I just felt like my mom really was a little bit different. And, and she always made it a point, like you will never be submissive to anybody. You will hold your roots and you will respect you know, um, like the saying, the, the janitor, the same way you respect the CEO, there ain't no difference. And I really grew up with that. So my mother, she continues to be that superwoman. <laughs> Thank you, Eileen. <laughs> you know, for me, my, uh, my parents and my uncles definitely like set the foundation for me. Uh, I come from a family of really strong uh, men and women that, you know, came to the United States. So my, my parents and my aunts and uncles, they were like the first generation that came over from the Dominican Republic. And, you know, they, uh, they just worked hard. You know, they didn't have an education. They just worked hard. My dad was a construction worker. My uncles were mechanics or electricians. And I feel like they set the foundation. And then once I left home at 17, I had some really great leaders. Uh, whether it was in the army or after I got out of the army, I really only had two full-time jobs my whole life. It was the army and then Discovery Cube. Um, so I, I've just had some great leaders that that kind of put in me, like, you can do anything. Like, don't ever, it doesn't matter that you're Hispanic. I, I'm the first Hispanic VP in the history of my company. You know, the first minority, actually, VP in the history of my company. So it was like, they, they just kind of instilled that in me. So I kind of use that. And now I'm at a point where I can see it in the uh, in employees underneath me coming up. Like I try to encourage them, I involve them. I don't care whether you're the cleaning crew. When I have a meeting, like I was just in a construction meeting two days ago. And I literally had people there from every single department. And they were probably wondering why I had them there. And I was like, look, this is the construction going up. This is how much we're going to spend. And it's because I want everyone to be involved because my leaders before me involved me. So I would say, yeah, it definitely started with my parents, but it continued on with strong leaders. Thank you, Luis. Um, senior Luis, my answer is sort of different. I, I, I appreciate everything that my family, my sisters, my mother and my father did for me. But my answer was actually <clears throat> uh, Jorge Luis Borges, who's a writer from Argentina uh, and the, the guy wrote fiction and he wrote nonfiction. And the, the first the first time that I picked up a book by him, I just I read through it and I was like, wow, I didn't know this kind of mind existed in this world. Um, you know, he would just reference so many things in history and writers that I'd never heard about. And so it had me uh, intrigued to know more about uh, just anything and everything in the world. I mean, it, it, it's so fascinating when so you, you come across somebody who just has that kind of mentality to go out and investigate just anything and everything. And I think that's something that really inspired me to become a lawyer and just to become who I am today. Um, yeah, Jorge Luis Borges. Thank you. Yeah, so many great, great different ways of inspiring us uh, into our careers. Awesome. Um, all right, so we have time for our last question too. Um, so what advice would you like to give to individuals that are in attendance today? Ask questions, network, build community. It's not about, I mean, it's, what you know definitely matters, but it's also about who who you know, right? So network, network. Um, I would say it's a little cliche, but if if at first you don't succeed, just dust yourself off and get up and continue trying, and don't ever let anyone deter you from your dreams or goals or anything that you want to do in life. Hi, <clears throat> Stevie Ruiz. Um, I have another anecdote. It's uh, when I was working at that law firm, there were a couple of lawyers and I was expressing my interest in becoming a lawyer. And they said to me, <clears throat> no, you don't want to go to law school. It, it's too difficult. Uh, you don't want to do that. We don't recommend it. You shouldn't become a lawyer. And I didn't only hear that from the lawyer that I worked for, but I heard it from other lawyers in the building. And everybody said, it's just such a struggle. Why would you want to spend three years of your life uh, sitting down in front of books and then studying for the bar exam. It's going to take away two, two, year, two months of your life. You, you'll never be the same after that. 
And even though everybody around me said to me, don't become a lawyer, I still went forward and became a lawyer. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know how you would take that, but even if people are telling you, don't do this, it's going to be too difficult and you feel passionate about what you're going to do, go forward and do it. Um, I, I would say, you know, don't think that, um, you know, that, that you're stuck in whatever career path you're on. You know, I, like I said, I've had three different careers in my life so far and I'm 47 years old and, you know, I don't know if I'll have another one, but um, definitely don't get stuck thinking that just because, you know, you're, you're there now that you're not going to succeed. And actually, as you go through the journey and as you get older, you'll realize that all of those th different things that you did, th that you did, they all sum up and they all help your present. Uh, I think uh, a tip of advice, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and quote it for from um, the great Nipsey Hustle is the game's going to test you but never fold. Um, and, you know, back to what Miriam was saying, don't give up, right? It sounds cliche, but and, and you know, just like um, Ms. Santo said, just stand back up and take it day by day. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to cry. It's okay to feel like, oh man, do I belong here? But you do, you belong in that table and you belong to have a chair there. And, you know, to one day own that table like Luis and include everyone else who, um, you know, it was a part of the process. And definitely um, also don't let your passion die. There's gonna be a lot of injustices in whatever system you're in, whether school, whether law, whether, you know, business, um, but really root yourself to, it ain't personal, it's, it's a greater system and don't let that passion die. Wow, thank you so much. That's that's amazing pieces of advice from all of y'all. Um, all right, well, I wanted to open it up um, to the GCC community that we have today. Um, if anyone had any questions that they would like to ask any of our panelists. Carmen says, thank you. I have, I have, a, question. I have a question for you. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, as a professional, do you feel the need to assimilate to a white standard when you're at work? And if you do, how do you address that? And how do you um, incorporate who you are into your workplace, especially if you're in a place where you're working with predominantly white, um, in a predominantly white culture? Thank you, Alexander, for that question. That's a great question. Um, I, I can I could give you my, you know my answer. Um, I don't. Um, I'm you know I'm I'm proud of uh, being American. I'm proud of being Dominican, and wherever I go, that's who I am. So I'm the same person. If you're my friend personally, or if I know you at work, now I will tell you that sometimes you know I have to watch things that I say because growing up Dominican, you hear a lot of things in the household that if you were able to repeat them, you know, you probably get in trouble. So, so for example, if I'm having a friendly conversation with someone at work and they bring up a topic, I normally don't give an opinion because if, especially if it's a controversial one, now if it's work related, I will. Um, but I will tell you that, no, I don't, I don't feel different. As a matter of fact, when I worked in Orange County, they were predominantly white, all of management was, and it didn't matter to me. I was still Lewis, the same guy that I am today. I can share also a little bit about that. Um, I don't either, and, and it's through different forms, right? Um, one of them is definitely, you see a lot of the code switching. Um, obviously, you know, in, in, a, in a meeting that we're talking about like data for a child or things of that sort, even then it's catching yourself in, is this academic jargon right now? And, and is this, you know, um, the Western language, are my parents going to understand this, who I'm explaining it to? So even changing, you know, the, the information, the way it's given, I, you know, pretty much engage in Spanglish a lot of the times, um, because for me, it's, it, the parents are my main priority. Now, if, if administration or anybody has anything to say regarding that, there's conversations that can be held in terms of, you know, my parents didn't feel respected in that, you know, the way that they came to school dressed was commented on, right, um, because there's no, type of dress code that should be followed for a parent if they're coming in and 
you know, casual wear or so for me, it's not assimilating in from the minor things like dress code and things of that sort to the bigger conversations about is there any situation where their culture or their identity has to be suppressed to be making others feel comfortable, right? I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's just a little bit on, on how the, the way I see it. Uh, for me, it's just the importance of taking up space and um, teaching others about diversity, right? Um, even having daring conversations about addressing implicit bias and even like recognizing ours and all kind of, it's pretty hard, right? So I think it's a growing experience, but um, it goes back to taking up space, your voice matters and don't change the way that you talk, you bring in, you bring in culture, like a lot of companies are promoting that, right? Well, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, don't silence yourself. Um, I actually don't either. Um, I mean, I don't necessarily have to deal with a lot of white people, but um, but when I do, it's mostly for requests or for an event or something like that. And I'm just me. Um, I speak the way I speak. I, you know, I, I'm just me. So I don't let any of that get to me, really. Sorry, one last thing. Um, and also don't um, like allow yourself to be like the token board of, of you know, if, if we're promoting diversity, oh, you're the only Latinx female here. We're gonna, no, you know, we're not, we're not gonna be the token image to promote diversity. Diversity can be promoted in many other ways. So, you know, if there's gonna be change, are you gonna conversate with me about my ideas or, you know, more than just my physical image? Because like we're mentioning now, um, the Latinx community is, is a wide range and we're not all from Mexico, it, it's huge. So my image will not create a change or diversity, it's more than that. Right. Yes, thank you so much for your comments and, um, keeping fighting that white supremacy that could sneak into our our workplaces in different areas. Um, I just wanted to see if there was any last comments. Um, but other than that, thank you all so much for being here today. Um, I really appreciate you sharing uh, your different experiences and backgrounds with all of our GCC community. Um, I know a lot of people are going to walk away with this being uh, really impacted um, and, and in a good way. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone. I love that we're all so different in different spaces, right? And even our Spanish is different, but uh, we all have that resilience and our cultura is just beautiful. So thank you for sharing your stories and you know, empowering, inspiring all that you do. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Have Bye -bye. a blessed one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.